There's no way we can uh, push AI further if, if we don't have access to data and if we don't have people participating in these uh, systems. As a result, we're going to have more tension between data privacy and AI. If we really want to push AI, we're going to have to potentially compromise on privacy. Welcome to the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. Each episode shares transformative insights and advice from members of Forbes Councils, a group of invitation-only communities for successful executives and entrepreneurs. This is Inside Forbes Councils. Hey, everyone, and welcome to episode 11 of the Inside Forbes Councils podcast. I'm your producer, Stephen Ganoza. Today, we're going to switch things up a little bit. Forbes Technology Council member and Delphix founder, Jedediah Yua, has a real treat to share with us. He recently interviewed Peter Kairouz, a research scientist at Google. Their discussion covers a lot of ground, including the competing needs and demands that businesses, consumers, and regulators have when it comes to data privacy and how businesses can find the path forward to innovate. So without further ado, here's Jedediah Yua and Peter Kairouz. Data is really fueling innovation today. And one of the things I like to say is that every company is a data company. My name is Jedediah Yuo. I'm the founder and chairman of Delphix. And we help companies promote flow of their data across all of their most innovative programs. One of the things that's really driving transformation is the use of data to to cure diseases, use it around um, leverage artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, and to unlock better productivity and better opportunities for businesses. But innovation really is coming at a big price today, and we can see that price with very large tech companies like Facebook and Apple and Google. Data privacy is becoming increasingly a big concern for the world around us. And so today I'm pleased to have us be joined by Peter Kairouz, a postdoctoral research fellow at Stanford. And uh, Peter, can you tell us a little bit about your work? Yeah, thanks so much, John. I'm very excited to, to be here with you. So as you said, I'm a postdoc at Stanford, um, and I mainly research uh, privacy and security for AI and machine learning. And um, really what it essentially all boils down to is uh, how do you allow users to publish their data and give their data to big service providers in a privacy-preserving fashion? Yeah, it's a pretty fascinating and important topic. You know, one of the things that's put us in a bind in the world today is a lot of these companies, they use machine learning and deep learning to, to drive what shows up in their services and in their products. Facebook, for instance, will use machine learning uh, to determine what you're going to see in their feed. Um, tell us a little bit about how AI and machine learning can actually be used not only to create the privacy problems, but maybe even protect privacy. Yeah, so so it's, it's very interesting. Um, AI is amazing, and uh, as he said, it, it, it's being used by all these companies and even startups to create beautiful technologies and offer their users with amazing services, from personalized recommendations to like finding causes and cures to diseases and whatnot. So it's fascinating, and and as you said, this creates uh, a problem of of data privacy. But at the same time, we can use AI and machine learning to do privacy. And and this is a a high level how we can do it. If, for instance, we can learn to create synthetic data, uh, then we could, instead of sharing the original data that contains a lot of sensitive attributes, we can instead share the synthetic data that in some sense erases all these sensitive stuff. And the service provider would then be able to build the model on the shared synthetic data. And and so in order to learn how to create good synthetic data, we need AI and machine learning. And so this is one way in which AI and machine learning can help us do privacy. Now we we provide um, data masking and synthetic data for a lot of the Fortune 500. That's part of the platform that we provide at Delphix. Uh, One of the challenges is that you still need to have real data. Users need to inject real data if they want to see the benefits of their own data. 
for instance, if I if I want an Uber to pick me up at a certain location, I've got to give them my data about my location, my credit card. So how will synthetic data help when you have to provide data, the trade-off when you have to provide data to get a benefit? Yeah. So so the way the way I envision this is you will have to give uh, some data which is going to be processed and as you mentioned, there's some data masking tools that are going to erase um, all the sensitive things. And then we're going to crunch numbers and build the synthetic data. And then once you create a synthetic copy of a database that you have, that synthetic copy is potentially not going to be linkable to the original one. And it can be used for all these purposes. Uh, for instance, um, let's say the NIH has access to a massive data set of uh, thousands of uh, health records of actual patients, and it wants to release a synthetic copy of it in order to encourage medical researchers and machine learning scientists to try to find causes and cures for diseases. So this type of a technology can be used by the NIH in order to, instead of releasing the true original data set, which is extremely sensitive, now you release a synthetic and anonymized data set, which can be used by these machine learning researchers in academia or even industry. Now, a lot of companies are looking at artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, different kinds of algorithms around their data. And uh, most of these companies are, are beginning to apply these kinds of algorithms and technologies to drive operational efficiency. What are some of the innovative ways you're seeing researchers look into the use of AI or, or even companies um, using AI? Yeah, I mean, um, if you look at, for instance, tech companies, um, some are using it to provide better search and personalized search. Others are using it to improve, uh, to give you recommendations, personalized recommendations. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, Netflix, it would tell you which movies you might be interested in watching. Amazon would uh, recommend products that you might you may want to buy. Um, so it can be used for uh, personalized recommendations. Also, a lot of companies are now building personalized uh, personal assistants. Uh, Amazon Echo, uh, Alexa is extremely successful. Uh, we have Google Home and also Apple has a new product in that space. So that's, of course, leveraging uh, AI and machine learning. So it's, it's just incredible how, how much you can do with these technologies and, and, and different businesses are using it in many different ways. Hospitals and, and even doctors are using it to try to diagnose patients, to try to understand what's going on and give recommendations. So it's, it's really uh, fueling a lot of businesses and industries, not just uh, tech and science, but also across, uh, you know, business, uh, you know, ma marketing management and uh, and also the health sectors. With the rise of the internet a few decades ago, companies were really caught flat-footed, and they they had to learn how to become software companies, make use of software throughout their organizations. Today, I today I theorize that companies are really behind on using data especially when it comes to making data a center point for the value and the revenue driving, uh, driving revenue for their businesses. You're working on some pretty interesting technologies around AI. Can you tell us a little bit about AI at the edge and decentralized uses of AI? Yeah, of course. So it turns out that um, with the growth in, 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 in the number of devices that are connected to the internet, and with the growth of the volume of the data, um, the classical model of sending all the data to the cloud where you store it and then access it to build AI models and to run all these computations and then send back a recommendation to the user, um, this classical model is envisioned to fail within the next five to 10 years. And, and the reason is it cannot scale to tens of billions of connected devices and potentially up to like a trillion connected device. So one alternative way of doing this is to say, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to compute on the edge. And, and this is what I'm referring to as kind of decentralizing AI and machine learning. And so in this way, what you get is instead of having to send all the collected data to the cloud, you could potentially compute on it locally on the device, perhaps on 
a smart car or a phone or a tablet or some smart watch. And then you would only need to send a brief summary to the cloud. And this has many, many benefits. So as, as I said before, you don't have to transmit a lot of data, so you don't have to throttle the network. And uh, from a privacy perspective, you don't even have to send the raw data anymore. You just perhaps send some updates or a brief summary that removes all these sensitive things. Um, and so now you build these models on the devices and you use them at the edge of the network. It, it provides more robustness and it's much better from a latency perspective. So if a car, if you're driving a car and then there's potentially a kid crossing the road, you don't want the car to send multiple images to the cloud for them to be analyzed and then for a decision to come back. What if, for instance, there's no internet or there's no LTE connectivity? You want the decision to be done automatically on the device. So, so that's, 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 I think, a very cool technology that Qualcomm, Google, and many other companies are actually looking into. And I believe that within the next few years, we're going to see a number of startups that are going to venture in that direction. Now, developments like decentralized machine learning these are these are these are really interesting and innovative new developments how how are how are things like privacy and regulations going to keep up with all the innovation because there's really this tension between innovation and regulation and data privacy yeah that's that's actually a fascinating question i mean as you mentioned before there's no way we can uh push ai further if if we don't have access to data and if we don't have you know more and more uh, you know people participating in these uh, systems and so as as a result we're going to have more tension between data privacy and ai if we really want to push ai there's 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 we're going to have to potentially compromise on privacy and so uh, regulation here is is expected to help in at least easing this tension, and and it's it, I mean I imagine that there's going to be a set of uh, laws that are hopefully going to be passed in all over the world, not just in the U.S. Uh, in Europe, the, there's the GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation. Um, it, it's it's not enough yet, but what they say is. Essentially, you need more transparency. You need to be able to tell the user what is it that you're collecting about them, what is it that you know about them, and what is it that you're storing and keeping on your servers. And this is essentially where GDPR stops. Moving forward, uh, the user should have more access to their own data, and, 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 and you should be able to give the user some meaningful privacy guarantees. So you should be able to say, all right, if we build models using your data, and if we ship these models to other user devices, we can guarantee that in case of a leak, if there's some spyware or malware running on other user devices, by examining these learned models, people will not be able to say anything specific about your data, which was used in the training of the models. And, and that, that can be done, um, for instance, by leveraging uh, differential privacy, which is a very cool uh, data privacy technology. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about differential privacy? Of course. I mean, uh, a lot of my research has focused on differential privacy. And, and, and the way differential privacy operates is uh, it introduces randomness into the results of the computations that are done on underlying sensitive data sets. So, so let me try to be a bit more specific here. Um, what, what differential privacy says is that if you're running a computation on a data set, um, you would add some noise to that computation so that the result would look the same with or without a user, a one single user data. Um, and, and, and because of this property, an observer, or if you want an adversary, who looks and examines the result of this noisy computation would have a hard time in trying to reconstruct the data of that particular user that, that we were targeting. And so, and so in a nutshell, this differential privacy technology says that you need to add structure noise in a very specific way so that you provide guarantees for the users. That's very fascinating. 
you know, Facebook used to have a long-term motto that they, they, that they used to say, which was move fast and break things. And they ended up breaking privacy and a lot of regulations for the entire world. It looks like we're entering into a new era where we're going to be able to use the benefits of machine learning and AI to help, help combat some of these challenges with data privacy. Uh, Peter, I really wanted to thank you for your time. It was great to have you. And um, you can get more information at Delphix.com. Thank you. Thanks so much. Great. I want to thank both Jedediah and Peter for a fantastic discussion on privacy and data and for sharing it with all of us on the Inside Forbes Council's podcast. We'll see you on the next episode. This has been Inside Forbes Councils. Please be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you're a member of the Forbes Councils and would like to participate in our podcast series, please email your member concierge. If you're interested in joining a Forbes Council, learn more at ForbesCouncils.com.